All right. First, if you are unfamiliar with Nonprofit Vote, we make free nonpartisan voter engagement materials, including toolkits, fact sheets, and these webinars, available to nonprofits across the country. Nonprofits can and should engage the people they serve in voting and elections, because our democracy is better when everyone participates. Get in touch if you need training or materials customized to your organization, or visit our website to see what's already there. We just got our Census 2020 page up for those of you who will be getting out the count, but we also have guides on candidate engagement, uh, more about ballot measure, adv advocacy, how to run a voter registration drive, and more. So one of my favorite parts of this job is that I get to find expert speakers every month to deliver fresh, relevant content. But my favorite part of every webinar is when our audience and speakers engage in a question and answer session, diving deep into your challenges and ideas. So please use that chat box provided to send us your questions. So let's dive into our agenda. Today, Kelly Dupree will cover what a ballot measure is, why nonprofits should get involved in ballot measure advocacy, and the coalition and campa campaign building processes. Then we'll hear from John Brodigam, a consultant and the Council and Senior Policy Advisor to League of Women Voters of Maine, who has worked on many ballot measure campaigns, including ranked choice voting, which successfully got on the ballot and was passed by voters. Lastly, we'll hold our question and answer session with our speakers. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The slides and recording will be sent to all attendees as well as posted on our website for you to revisit and share. All right, now I'd like to introduce Kelly. Uh, Kelly Dupree is the Director of Partnerships and Training at the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, where she provides strategic assistance to national and in-state partners, as well as oversees several programs, including training, ballot integrity, and the Road Ahead Conference. Before joining BISC, Kelly worked for Planned Parenthood as the VP of Public Policy and Communications for Planned Parenthood and Southwest and Central Florida, and before that as the Regional Fields Manager for Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Kelly has made a career advocating for a variety of progressive causes, having also worked for USAID, the Democratic National Committee, Unity 09, and EMILY's List. She also serves as an adjunct training for Wellstone Action. Kelly, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, glad to be back on the webinar I presented with you guys last year as well, and we had a great conversation, so I am looking forward to that. But let me just jump in um, to talk to you guys about um, ballot measures and how nonprofits can get involved. I think one thing that's always really helpful is to give some um, common language so everyone knows what we're talking about when we say ballot measures or ballot initiatives. There's actually four different types of initiatives. Um, there's what we call initiated statutes, um, and that's when citizens can gather signatures to get um, something on the ballot that will change a law or create a new law in the state. There's initiated amendments, which is again where citizens can gather signatures um, to actually change the state constitution. So that can tend to be a little bit more permanent generally and have more of an impact. Um, there's also referendums when people can gather signatures to overturn a law that the legislature has passed and the governor has signed. And then there's what we call legislatively referred amendments, which um, aren't really initiatives per se because they can only come through the state legislature. Um, and state legislatures will often put things on the ballot um, around, actually the issues can vary. You see them around um, taxes, tax issues, voting rights issues, all kinds of things will end up on the ballot through the state legislature as well. So those are the four types that we see, and at this we kind of use the umbrella term of ballot initiative or ballot measure to cover all of these. Um, but they're not all the same, and actually not every state can even do them. They're, um, what we have is 
about 24 states, I say about because New Mexico is an outlier and New Mexico and Maryland are outliers, but about 24 states can do initiatives where they can collect signatures to either put a um, statute or an amendment on the ballot. Some states limit you to one kind and some states allow you to do both. And then you also have, oh, hold on, I see that people see it say that the audio is cutting out. I will get closer to my phone and hopefully that will help. Um, so the, um, sorry, I'm just going to pause for a second. Okay, never mind. Caitlin's on it. So the, um, so you have states that can do um, gather signatures for initiatives um, in 24 states. And then you have New Mexico and Maryland where citizens can gather initiatives for referendums where they can um, overturn laws that have, that have been passed by the legislature. Um, in all the other states on this map that are not colored in, so like Texas, Louisiana, those states don't have a citizen initiative process, but the legislature can put things on the ballot. So some of you might be in those states and remember voting on issues that were on the ballot, and that's because that's how things happen there, those constitutional amendments go through. Um, and I always like to do this kind of overview so people know um, depending on where you live in the country, how these um, things affect you and what's possible for you. But then also when we talk about who can do them, um, I always like to emphasize that anyone can do ballot measures. C3s and C4s can do ballot measure campaigns. For C3s, you especially want to be um, cautious of your um, legal limitations and make sure that you are consulting with a lawyer all the way through. Um, because for a ballot measures, a lot of the work for C3s um, are con is considered direct lobbying. So you just want to make sure that you are consulting with a legal team as you are going about the work. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but there are resources available to, if you need help um, kind of approaching that. But I always like to give that caveat. What I really want to talk about is why you should do ballot measure campaigns. And there's quite a few reasons about why C3 should get involved. Um, my hope is that with everyone being on this call, you're already interested in how you can do more political work and do more electoral work. But I actually think it's important to highlight that there's a lot of reasons that ballot measures play an important role in the political system. The first is that they are a, a direct vehicle to create policy change. We unfortunately do not get things, always get things passed through state legislatures, um, whether um, it's lack of will or lack of ability. State legislatures are not always addressing the policies that most deeply affect communities that we are trying to serve. So ballot measures are a great way to create that policy change. They also can play a big role in shifting public understanding. They, by just by introducing the topic of conversation during an election, you can actually change people's opinions on how they feel about an issue. A great example of this is actually the fight over marriage equality, which over many years, the conversation started to change and you could actually see that um, in how people were talking about it day to day. Uh, I can say, for example, with my family, how my family was talking about it in 2000, 2000 versus 2012 is just really different because the conversation had been changed over these constant ballot fights and what people were, were talking about. So they do play a role in shifting public understanding. They are a great opportunity for leadership development in communities. Um, they offer multiple um, areas of ways of entry for people to get involved in ballot measure campaigns and learn skills that they can take other places. And then they also play a really key role in movement building um, and helping us do long-term shifts in power and, um, and how we change policy. And I want to kind of um, go a little deeper into the movement building aspect in particular. So there is an organization in California, um, ACE, and they do a lot of long, they are both C3 and C4, and they do a lot of long-term strategy and power building and, rec and use ballot measures as one tool in order to get that work done. And so I just want to um, touch on an example there about how they do this in a way that's really helped them shift power. They um, break it down into three key pieces around base building, agenda setting, and messaging which are all connected and an early investment in all of these things can be really important to have the movement building capacity to keep winning on the issues that you care about and affect the communities that you want to support. And they can actually help um, spread out the investments and can actually get some cost savings as well. So when you're doing long-term organizing, um, ideally a year out if you can, but if you're really kind of keeping the cycle of long-term organizing going, 
it can lead to a lot of really good things. Among them, economies of scale. Um, often when you're trying to pass a policy, you are actually um, going to be outspent by the opponent, opposition. Not, I won't say always, but often when you're trying to get something on the ballot and move forward, get someone to vote yes on an issue, you are the ones, you, your opposition will spend more to try to defeat you. So if you are building, if you start building early, you have more time to get the base behind you and kind of lay the groundwork and set the messaging tone. And that can lead to economies of scale. This is actually a chance to create new awareness, show people the crisis and the problem you're trying to solve um, and that the ballot measure can be the solution for. It's also a great way to organize um, electoral resources and your constituents. Um, and the, actually, the, which, when I say your constituents in this particular case, I mean those affected by the issue you're trying to, the problem you're trying to solve, and they can identify what resources they're able to give, which isn't always money, and that's fine, because it can be time, it can be their expertise, there's a lot of great things. And then it helps you build long-term organizational and coalition capacity, and um, will provide the foundation for ongoing leveraging of, on legislative wins and other wins. So I want to kind of take a second to touch on the um, pie chart that's on the corner, which it's, I, someone reminded me today's pie day, so it's really quite lucky that I put the pie chart in there. But um, you'll see that the agenda setting piece is in a different color, and I think that's because I want to highlight it, that agenda setting should be one of the first things that you work on when going to approach a ballot measure issue. And it's a great way to utilize existing resources in your organization. So you can use your frontline community organizers or organizations that you're already talking to in places that you already um, are in partnership with to really talk to the communities that you're trying to assist or the, and figure out what issues are working for, are most important to them. Because sometimes what the issue we think most important is not the issue that's affecting people day to day and what motivates them. So if you, so for in ACE's case, they use frontline community organizers to actually canvas and talk to people in communities to find out what the emerging issue is in that community um, that's directly affecting them that they are most concerned about. They then take that issue and work with staff um, and clients and constituents of social service organizations to really identify ways they can address that problem and create a solution to it. And this actually acts as a leadership development tool because they're able to bring in their constituents to give them training on how to do this and have these conversations. And through the field organizing and civic education, it strengthens the coalitions that they're pulling together to shape a policy that will address their issue. Um, and it also works to create mutual commitment and accountability for a campaign that will be based on issue-driven solutions and inclusive collaboration. And what happens, because the issue that they are working to create a policy to address came from the community, from them listening to the community, they have immediate community buy-in when they create the, when they identify the ballot measure as the solution for the issue. They worked with the community to identify the crisis and create a clear solution. And from there, they're able to move forward to the next step of base building. Um, I just want to make a quick note about agenda setting is that it's really more about collaboration and mutual support than coming in knowing what you want from them. It's really you want to work with people to achieve maximum shared capacity and resources um, as you're identifying the issue that um, directly affects them. And you have to embrace some flexibility and um, with timing and with your expectations. Because you can't really set a rigid agenda a year out necessarily. Things will change. We live, I think it's hard sometimes to plan a month out in our current environment because things are changing so rapidly. So you really do have to be prepared to be flexible while doing this work. But once you do have your agenda, you've identified your crisis and what your solution is, you can work with to start doing base building which is your organizing plan, which will be, um, create an organizing plan focused on evaluation and building your volunteer base of affected clients and constituents to help move the issue forward and continue to change the conversation. Um, one key thing of that is, of course, picking the issue that turns people out, that makes them involved, but if you've worked with them to identify the issue through agenda setting, this shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, you want to work with people to do coalition-driven field events mobilizations, trainings, um, things like that to help test capacity um, and enthusiasm on an issue and keep building groups of people who can help push your campaign. You also want to work to establish mutual accountability and commitment 
through the course of this base building because it actually will enable honest evaluation and true performance capacity within the groups that you're working with. Because these are all things that you're doing in advance generally in advance of getting anything on the ballot before you really turn to electoral. You're still trying to build up people's enthusiasm for the issue. And so this is a great time to be constantly evaluating what you're doing to make sure it's right and that it's working and it's really bringing people in. And it's a great way to test your targeting um, infrastructure and get it in place in advance of an electoral campaign if you're going in that direction. It is, you can gather power, really speak with people about this, and then figure out how you want to target communities to, um, as you shift in strategy. And then the last piece, as you're doing the base building, is to really think about messaging and media. Year-round organizing helps gives you the opportunity to build important relationships with media and voters um, and change communities' opinions and get voters' um, attention outside of the election cycle when they're starting to get inundated. So if you're doing this, if you're having this conversation year-round, you're just going to have more opportunities to bring the topic to people's minds. Really the best initiatives, that, valid initiatives that we see, develop and come out of listening and engaging with people and educating them and letting them speak in their communities and be their spokespeople. C3 work is actually the best time to test and expand um, your messaging because it can help you, um, you can really find out what resonates with people as well as play a role in increasing the scope and scale of events to really raise um, the issue to the point where people see it as a crisis that needs a solution. So just an example of how you go from year-round organizing to shifting to ballot initiative work. Um, you really, all these other pieces, the agenda setting, the base building, the messaging, are all really important to give you the steps you need to move to the right side of the screen where you see it says ballot measure. So the ballot measure will be the solution to the crisis that you have created. And when I say crisis, it's really about helping people have identified the issue that is really affecting them that you know that this can be a solution to. It's not necessarily manufacturing a fake crisis. I'm trying to find the best phrasing for that, but um, you just want to make sure that the issue that you're addressing is the issue that people uh, most care about. But you can use all of your year-round organizing and work and messaging to help voters see the ballot measures as a solution to their problem. So that when you do shift to the electoral phase, to the ballot initiative phase, you've already laid some groundwork to make people more open to the messaging. You've lifted up the problem that, especially to your base, um, of people who maybe don't know about the issue, but they're already educated and ready to go. You'll have already targeted and identified your base, which will be hugely important when you move to electoral and you start um, focusing on making sure you get to a win number. And then you can actually have an opportunity to test ballot language while talking to voters before you actually have to file it um, so you can see what language best works. Um, within legal constraints in each state, every state has different rules about how you can do um, ballot titles and ballot language. But if you are in a state where you can write your own, this is a great way to test it before you shift to the campaign. So as you, so you've decided, you've done all of the year-round organizing, you've identified your issue, you're ready to think about actually putting something on the ballot. You think you know the issue that you want to solve through a ballot measure. So there are some key things that you need to stop and consider while thinking about putting a campaign forward. Um, and I kind of call these my um, decision time, the no or no go decision points. Um, all of these things, you don't need to check every single box in order to move forward with the ballot measure campaign, but these are great ways to check in with yourself and your coalition to make sure you actually have the resources you need to move forward. So some of the big things you want to think about is, do you have a coalition behind you? Are you in a place where there's already people, a group of people um, in the community who care about this issue and want to be part of it, or will you be going it alone? That is not something that we ever recommend, going it alone. Ballot measure campaigns are very expensive, and if you are the only person driving the issue, you might want to go back and check that you are picking the right issue that people care about. Because if you're going it alone, it often means you're not um, addressing the need of the community that you think you are. Um, if there's, you want to make sure that you're doing 
research, um, public opinion polling, and research on the issues that you are knowledgeable about where voters' uh, voters' feelings are um, and your path to success. You want to consider the political environment, and that really is thinking about what year, like what is the year that you're planning to put this on the ballot? What does it look like? Is it a presidential year or not a presidential year? How many other big things are on the ballot? Are you going to be the only thing, only statewide issue on the ballot? All of those things can affect your campaign um, and can affect your, the choices you make and what your budget will need to be. If you're in Ohio in a presidential year, it's probably going to be a little bit harder to buy television. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit harder to break through all the other presidential noise that it will be happening. So it doesn't mean you can't run a campaign that year. It just means you need to think about what that, how that affects you. You also want to talk about your actual ability to execute the campaign. And this means do you have the time, the money, and the people to do what you need to do? Um, and this, you may not have, there's not, and that doesn't mean there's a perfect balance of the three. It just can you compensate with what you have to get it to get all the way through to the end of the campaign? You want to know if you have key organizational support, which really does tie into ability to execute the campaign. Key organizational support is do you have the funders who are willing to help pay for it? Do you have the community voices that are behind the issue? And hopefully you do because you've done the base building work before the campaign. And then you want to know if you've thought about the impact of the issue that you're trying to pass. And this is something that people often forget, because sometimes um, when we pass an issue, we're like, great, we put something on the ballot, it's great, it's going to improve people's lives, we've won, we're great. But then we don't think about the un potential unintended consequences of this. Uh, I used to see this happen a lot with marijuana policy, where they were trying to legalize marijuana in states where while trying to write the most palatable language, they would actually create new um, criminal codes that affected different, that ended up re-victimizing groups of communities that they were trying to um, kind of help improve their lives. So it's really thinking about the impact of your campaign. Uh, is it improving people's lives in the long term and, or does it have unintended consequences? So I went through those key things very quickly um, because I just want to raise those points, but I do want to dig in on one that I think is potentially the most important and a, a place where C3 organizations in particular can play a really big role, and that's with coalition. And I always find it best to use a, an example um, of the coalition that we often work with. But coalitions, in what a, coalitions play an incredibly critical role in ballot measure campaigns. It takes a great deal of work to build and maintain a successful coalition, and the ballot can, so if you, ballot campaigns are stronger if, there's, if they start off with an existing strong coalition. Um, we often hear from people that when they build a coalition around one, one campaign, it just doesn't feel quite as strong or invested when, then when it's a coalition of people who have been working together for a while and have built the base of trust that they need. Some states actually have existing tables of coalitions that work on issues around ballot measures or other things. Um, Oregon, Ohio, Montana, those states have existing tables that are focused on these issues, so they have done a lot of the work um, in between elections to build this, um, this trust. But that's not, I don't, that's not a requirement that you have these tables to move forward, but it's something to think about when you're looking at an issue. Like, what is your state's story with that issue? Is there a history of collaboration among groups that you can bring to, together to work on that issue? When a coalition does function well, there's nothing better. You kind of feel unstoppable. You know you've got the power behind you. But if your state doesn't have a history of collaborating on the issue or of having well-run coalitions, it can make things um, much harder. You can certainly move forward without a strong coalition, but you often have to find a way to compensate, and this can mean either a lot more time or a lot more money or sometimes both. So we always recommend, if you can, work on building a strong coalition. And how you can build a strong coalition is often the question that we get. So I want to kind of go to the example of a civic engagement organization in Missouri that we often partner with. The, um, Missouri Organizing and Voter Engagement Collaborative, or MOVE. It is a C3 integrated voter engagement hub. They spend a lot of their time thinking about how they can build a strong coalition to help improve things in their state. And they came up with the four key points, four key things that they 
prioritized to allow themselves to build a strong coalition. The first thing they decided to do was get in a fight together. Pick an issue um, that you care about and just work together on it. They, being in a fight together was a really critical way to build trust and, and it helped them test the capacity of member organizations and seeing how they can fill each other, they can provide support and fill gaps for each other. And it was a great way to identify a staffing model that worked for the coalition. You want to focus on relationships grounded in mutual interests. And this is the importance of developing real relationships and trust, which often comes out of getting in those fights together. Um, and I say real relationships because they're very important at every level of an organization's leadership um, in a coalition. So even from the directors talking to each other to the grassroots organizers talking to each other, everyone needs to understand how to work together. And, these, and in Missouri, these, the groups they work with include the faith community, farm community, labor community, and other community groups. So people coming from very different backgrounds and even different um, self-interests that drove them to join the group, they focused on building real relationships with them to build the mutual interest and trust. They also, in forming the coalition, made a long-haul power commitment together. They decided that they were committed to power building and movement shifting and not just focusing on um, episodic campaign deliverables. They weren't just focused on winning one election or one legislative battle. They were focused on a long-term goal of change. So in Missouri, they were talking about registering over a million voters over a certain stretch of time. That is an ambitious goal, and they made sure that every plan they wrote under, um, focused on that and included it and helped move them towards that goal. And then finally, to build a strong coalition, they actually made sure that everyone had skin in the game, and that was really um, making sure that, they, that the people making the decisions for the coalition had brought something to the table and felt invested. So they, the way they structured it, there was actually a steering committee that makes the real final decisions. Um, and there are six steering committee members, and they have um, hard expectations. They had to pay membership dues. They had to commit to doing a certain number of contacts with voters a year. And they had to commit to being able to mobilize at least 1,000 people um, when needed for events, um, for events and for actions. And this, by getting a steering group of six people to commit to that, Every year, it gave them a solid base of people to rely on to get work done, and it allowed a group of six people that are allowed to set the strategic direction of the organization because they are investing the most into the organization, so they want to make sure it succeeds. And then there's other participating organizations that participate at other levels that also um, have access to certain things but may not be quite at the same level of um, decision-making as the steering committee. But these four pieces together helped Missouri, is helping Missouri, this um, coalition still exists, um, focus on a long-term power building plan. And I think it's just a really good model for if you're trying to build a coalition in a place where there has not been one, to think about it in this way. And that it's work that can be done C3. People often think it only can be done as C4 side, and that's just not the case. So MOVE is a great example of ways to think about this. And then, assuming you've done all the other stuff, you've thought about all of these things, um, you have your strong coalition, you, really, you actually have to start thinking about the ballot measure campaign, and they have multiple phases to them. And all of these things need to be taken into account over the course of a campaign, um, and they can show up in different ways in each phase. So for that reason, I want to emphasize that each phase actually requires its own distinct plan to reflect how the, your different considerations and resources will show up. So you have the qualification phase, which actually takes you through the quali qualifying for the ballot. So the qualification phase is really from when you file your ballot language through signature collection to being placed on, officially placed on the ballot by the Secretary of State or your elections official, whoever makes that decision in your state. Then you have your campaign phase, which is actually what takes you through ballot, after you've qualified for the ballot, it takes you through to election day. And this is the part people are probably most familiar with. Um, it's where you're actually talking to, voter, talking to voters, running ads, doing all that stuff to make sure voters are aware of your issue and actually show up on election day to vote. Um, and then you have the post-election phase, which is ballot measure campaigns is becoming increasingly more important for people to plan for um, and focus on. 
this is when you, it takes you through, you can have challenge, legal challenges after you win. The legislature usually has to take some sort of action to implement your measure. So you want to make sure that you're part of the implementation of the issue you're thinking about, um, that you're pushing. And, or I should say the legislature might try to change your issue. They might try to repeal it. They might try to make it harder for it to be put fully into effect. So you want to make sure that you can keep an eye on things that are happening. Um, so those are the kind of the key phases of campaigns. And there's a lot of pieces in within them. And FISC is happy to help um, answer any questions if people have those. So you should not hesitate to reach out. And I know that will be time for questions as well. But I'll turn it back over to Caitlin. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was um, a really great overview of ballot measure advocacy and why nonprofits should really get involved in this work. Um, I encourage our audience to you know, take this opportunity with these speakers to chat us your questions, and we'll go through those at the end. Um, but now we will um, turn it over to our next speaker who um, will go in a little more depth about what those ballot measure campaign phases looked like um, for um, campaigns in um, the state of Maine and provide a little um, sort of case study and insight um, into some of those highlights and challenges. So chat us your questions in the meantime, and I'll introduce John. Uh, who is a former state legislator and current attorney and consultant with a practice in public policy, election law, and legislative advocacy. From 2004 to 2008, he served in the Maine Legislature and was House of Chairman of the Insurance and Financial Services Committee. He served as Assistant Attorney General of Maine from 2000 to 2004, litigating issues related to prescription drug access and benefits. He was co-counsel in the successful defense of the Maine Rx program before the United States Supreme Court. He has successfully litigated several cases relating to public funding of Maine elections, including the 1996 constitutional challenge and a 2018 suit to compel payment of funds owed to candidates. John is currently counsel and senior policy advisor to the League of Women Voters of Maine and Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. He holds a degree from Stanford Law School. And let me unmute you, John. All right, hi, John. Do we have you there? Oh, all right. Let me just see. Uh, hello, John. Yeah. Do we have you now? Great. Yeah, all right. Know. Okay, good. I can hear you, and I will let you. Okay, I'll let you take you. it away now. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that was terrific. Um, really, really great presentation from BIS. Kelly and Caitlin, thank you both. Um, this is really a passion of mine and a passion of ours here in Maine. And so I'll, I'll just share a little bit with you about our um, organization and our experience over the years. Um, I'm going to focus on our Ranked Choice Voting Initiative in 2016, um, but I'm also going to refer to a handful of other initiatives that we've worked on going back to 1996. And one of the um, joys of this work is sometimes you get to work on more than one issue at the same time. It's sort of can't sometimes not planned that way, but it sort of happens, and that, that is what happened with um, clean elections in 2015 and Ranked Choice Voting in 2016. Um, overlapping a little bit there. So I had a, a different role in each of those campaigns, but over the years I've seen all of the different pieces of the campaigns. And um, Democracy Maine, which we are uh, really just launching our new logo there and our, our new um, partnership between the League of Women Voters and our uh, Maine Citizens for Clean Elections, our, our state flagship uh, campaign finance reform organization that's been around for about 22 years. Um, so if you go to the first slide, um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to repeat and reiterate everything that, that Kelly said in her terrific uh, presentation, but I will talk a little bit about the ranked choice voting effort and how that got started. 
Um, there have been, you know, the League of Women Voters has been uh, very uh, committed to de- democratic engagement and a wide range of democracy reforms, expanding the franchise, protecting voter rights, um, ensuring voter turnout, and so on. And the League uh, did what it always does. It, it conducted a lengthy study. Um, and I don't know that every uh, ballot initiative needs to do quite that kind of a study, but the League did a study that started in 2008 and ended in 2011 um, and issued a, a statement for the state of Maine that uh, endorsed um, ranked choice voting as a positive solution for some of the um, unfortunate trends in our, in our democracy in Maine. Um, so after 2011, um, it was really uh, just the league and a handful of individual leaders who were interested in this. Um, and the league continued to develop um, its position and started to think about actually writing legislation. Um, and in that process, uh, began to expand the coalition along the lines of what Kelly described, building partnerships um, with um, all the organizations that you might uh, imagine, um, to some extent, labor was there, um, the faith community, other good government groups, um, and progressive groups as well. And uh, bringing them into the coalition, um, he- hearing their input, um, including them in the study, of course, um, and making sure that um, everybody uh, was heard along the way. Um, so so there was... Um, Quite a, quite a bit of time between 2011 and 2015 when the actual language of the um, initiative was, was finalized. Um, we in Maine had um, something that you'll, you'll encounter in some cases. We had a, a legal challenge to what we were trying to do. Um, and that legal challenge um, affected uh, just about every step of the process, and it's still having uh, ramifications today. Um, But part of our early analysis on this was to try to ascertain um, whether there was a significant constitutional problem with ranked choice voting in Maine, and if so, how would we address that? Um, And there was probably six to nine months of really good work and thinking on that issue done back before the decision was made to go on the ballot. Um, But that was that was um, critically important because it turned out that we did need to have a strategy to um, deal with some legal challenges that came up that I'll, I'll describe in a minute. Um, so I, I would say items three and four here on this list, uh, gathering information and assessing possible solutions. I, I do think it's a really critically important in the early, very early phases before you have drafted legislation Um, to have a crystal clear idea of the problem. And that um, comes from those conversations, that listening effort um, and analysis. And um, there's just a lot of hard work and a lot of time at the the kitchen table talking through with friends and allies, like what is the nature of the problem? And then um, in the case of clean elections, we actually – Um, did a great deal of research on the role of money in state politics here in Maine. We did analysis of who was contributing to which candidates, political action committee money, political party money, um, special PACs that were controlled by legislative committee chairs, and we got that information out to the public. Um, So there was a whole public education effort uh, before this was really even a citizen initiative. It was completely C3 work. It was completely... Uh, valuable for its own purposes, but it ended up um, sort of sowing the seeds of the work that was to come um, so that the public uh, understood the nature of the problem, our analysis of the problem. They were then ready for our uh, assessment of what a possible solution was. Um, There are always a a lot of different possible solutions. Um, There are a whole spectrum of things from, you know, really totally transformative to just uh, incremental change. Um, With ranked choice voting, um, we really went for the whole uh, shebang. We we included all of the races that we could think of for ranked choice voting, the state legislative races, the gubernatorial race, uh, the primaries, and the general election, U.S. Congress, U.S. House of Representative races and U.S. Senate races all 
uh, general and primary, we said, let's just, let's just run, we're going to apply ranked choice voting to all of them. And um, it, was a, it was a broad net that we cast. It was an aspirational effort. And it really, I think, in, our, in this case, helped us with our messaging and our conversation to be able to talk about it as a transformation, transformational change. Uh, next slide. Um, so this, I've already talked a little bit about some of this, but um, you know, it may not be obvious that you need to go to a citizen initiative. Of course, there are other strategies. Um, I would just say one thing about the legislative pathway. I'm here in Maine, and I think most of the other initiative states, if you launch a citizen initiative, you do um, need to bring it to the legislature before it goes out to the ballot to give the legislature a chance um, to weigh in on it and possibly even to pass it so that you don't need to go to the ballot. Um, that almost never happens, but it is part of the process, um, and it is a legitimate um, pathway for, you know, under some circumstances to take something through the legislature. Um, I think, as Kelly pointed out, there are enormous advantages to running a statewide campaign. I mean, it's very expensive, and it consumes your life for a while, but um, that at, the end, at the end of the day, you have enormous buy-in from, from many people. I mean, myself and I know many other people who citizen initiatives was how they got involved in organizing and in politics in general. Um, and I think that's just, it's a win-win situation. Or even if you, even if you don't succeed and sometimes you won't, um, at the end of the day, you have energized a bunch of people, you've trained them, you've taught them, you've, you've cultivated their passion. And at the end of the day, um, you've got a whole new uh, generation of people who are um, committed to using the tools of democracy to try to bring about social change. So it's really, you know, there are a lot of good reasons to go to the, go to the citizen initiative uh, route here. Um, refining the solution, uh, obtaining a consensus, uh, these are all just reiterating things that um, have already been said. Um, the process, you know, there's some legal stuff in here of exactly getting the legislative language right here in Maine. Um, the Attorney General's office and the revisers of statutes um, have a chance to review the language before it goes out to signature collection. And they're not supposed to tinker with the um, content, but they do, they are supposed to help um, resolve, you know, issues around drafting and, and they usually do a pretty good job with that. Um, but it is a delay, it does delay. Um, and they also apply a fiscal note noting any cost that the initiative will incur. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of questions around uh, timing here. Um, you have to make strategic decisions about what the electorate is that you're shooting for. Um, I think you have, to do, you have to do some polling, although I never think that polling is a substitute for having the courage of your convictions on an issue. Um, I would always rather have a group of people who are completely committed and willing to throw themselves into something than necessarily have a poll that says you have a 15% chance of winning this or whatever. Um, so I, I do think that um, there are questions around forming a separate uh, legal entity, uh, 501c4, uh, incorporating, um, creating a steering committee, doing all the things you have to do to form a corporation, um, creating bylaws and so on. That's all part of, of the process. And those people that are, you know, you can do that before you have the, the language finalized, but more often than not, it, that happens as you're moving into the campaign phase. Okay, next slide. Um, the signature collection. Um, uh, this is the part that a lot of people are familiar with, um, but in Maine we had, um, I'm gonna tell you one uh, campaign that we had that was a actually a people's veto, where we had, um, the timing was not at our choice. With ranked choice voting, we, um, the legislature did a partial repeal of ranked choice voting in, in late October of 2017, and we had 90 days to get 65,000 signatures. And so that meant people collecting signatures over the holidays, standing on street corners in zero degree weather across the state of Maine within a tight timeline um, that was completely beyond our control. But since there was the passion of the people who had already once um, secured a win for ranked choice voting in the 2016, um, election, uh, we were able to um, gather the signatures for the people's veto to reverse the um, legislative action there. 
Um, and that signature gathering was a heroic effort. And again, there are people that were part of that. I will never, never forget that effort. And um, you know, they're organizers for the rest of their lives, not because of what they, what they did, and and the relationships that they built during that process, and the experience of getting um, the people together to reverse an act of the legislature. Um, I'm going to skim through the rest of this because I think we only have a little bit of time left, and um, we do have uh, we want to have some time for questions. Um, but um, the legislative um, this is uh, the process that I referred to in Maine with uh, the legislator, legislature getting a chance to review the bill, um, questions about whether or not to have a public hearing in the legislature. I think recently the trend in Maine has been to try to just dispose of the bill without a public hearing and allow it to go straight off to the ballot. Um, and then the negotiating the ballot question language, we've had cases in Maine where we've actually litigated exactly what the words are on the ballot when we felt that the Secretary of State had not um, fairly described the ballot question language. There's really nothing more important than the words that the voter actually is going to see in the ballot when they go in to vote. And that is a critical component of this. In more recent years of ranked choice voting and the people's veto, um, we had a better relationship with the Secretary of State and we were able to offer them drafts of language that they considered and used to sort of improve their original approach on the ballot question language. But that's a place of engagement that's critically important and it helps to have good relationship with the people who are decision makers on that. Um, next slide. And then the campaign. Um, the ballot question uh, language was approved in late June for the um, ranked choice voting vote in 2016. And um, you know, you have to um, fight for resources with other campaigns, both candidate campaigns and perhaps issue campaigns. Um, you have to do all of the things um, that uh, Kelly mentioned previously. Um, in Maine, you know, it usually requires at least a million dollars to run a statewide campaign or, um, you know, many times that if you're really going to be aggressive about it and if it's going to be a hotly contested race. Um, we usually talk about hundreds and hundreds of volunteers um, and dozens of organizations working together. So that um, you know, it requires a full-blown campaign uh, staff, campaign manager. Um, all of the organizing positions in the campaign have to be filled in short order and have to get out there and um, start, start that direct campaign work with only about four or five months uh, until the vote. Um, so that's, uh, that's critically important. Um, and um, obviously that many of you on this call have run a lot of other campaigns and so you know that piece um what that what that entails um but you know it's the the emphasis here is that in maine with ranked choice voting you know that campaign ran from june to november of 2016 but this said when we started the the whole effort began in 2008 with the study that league of women voters conducted on ranked choice voting and i don't think every campaign has to last that long but it does give you a sense of um, you know, building the foundation, doing the deep organizing, identifying the problem, communicating about the problem to the public, listening to the public, um, anticipating the problems and the, def and the def arguments against you and the organizational challenges and the fundraising challenges um, before, you get, before you get going. Um, but then um, you get that um, feeling when the polls close at 8 o'clock on Election Day and you get to watch the results start to come in and it's all worth it. Um, I think I'll stop there because I think we don't have all that much time left for questions, and I'd rather let you decide what you want to talk about. Well, thank you for that um, overview, John, of everything that uh, it took to get ranked choice voting on the ballot. Um, we do have a lot of great questions, so um, I will pose them to to each of you, um, Kelly and John. So I think this first one might be a good one for you, Kelly. Is there some sort of directory for coalitions on either the state or national level? I really wish there was. I wish there was. Uh, there would be a great for a national directory of coalitions. I think one place that can be helpful 
is the America Votes website. It's just americavotes.org. They have a lot of the coalition partners in the states that they work in, um, which is about 16 states at this point, I think, that can be really helpful. Um, otherwise, there's unfortunately not a huge directory of all of them um, in any state. I think the best way to go about trying to find people is to think, pick an issue and then see who works on the issue in that state, and that can um, kind of help you get to where you need to be. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. If a ballot measure is passed, does it still depend on state government funding to be meaningful, or does that depend on whether funding is written into ballot language? Um, well, I can describe what it is in Maine. Uh, in Maine, if the ballot question requires funding and it's passed by the voters, then there's an automatic 45-day delay, um, which allows the legislature time to address the funding situation. Um, but if the legislature at the end of 45 days does not fund the program, it still takes effect. Um, so the legislature cannot... Um, just by doing nothing, uh, defeat the will of the voters in that situation here in Maine. Um, and that's generally true in most states. Um, you, some, it really diff, does differ by state, but the, if the funding mechanism is written into the measure, the legislature would have to invalidate the measure entirely or get rid of that funding mechanism, which is unlikely um, in, in order to change it. But if the if it's not written in and the legislature has to actually find the funding, then yes, it does become dependent on them in a lot of states. And I'll just add on, you know, it, I think it is pretty dependent on the state you're in. And I know um, I'm located in Massachusetts and we saw um, a measure that we, we thought would appear on the ballot in 2018 be taken off because uh, not because it included funding, but because in Massachusetts it was argued that you were asking the voters to vote on two things, because it was saying that there would be um, this additional tax uh, levied on certain incomes and that the, that revenue would go to um, education and transportation. So, um, you know, there was a long, hard fight to get that on the ballot, and then on the 11th hour it was struck because it was not considered, um, you know, legal to be asking a voter two different things in one question. So I think a lot of research and maybe retaining some counsel, someone like John, or at least working closely with uh, BISC, um, you can sort of figure out how to approach that. Um, and there was a second part of this question um, about, um, What's, what's your take on why there's often a discrepancy between seemingly progressive ballot initiatives being passed in traditionally conservative states? I can answer that from the BISC perspective, which is that we actually believe that ballot initiatives are, while people label them as progressive or conservative, and I think that that's okay to do because issues fall in different um, Sides, the way voters tend to feel about these issues when they go to the ballot is, does this improve my life in some way? So they, take, they don't see it from a partisan lens as much. Um, so voters approach things much more neutrally when it comes to ballot measures, and they actually take them more seriously than they do candidates. We've seen that in polling, that they view ballot measures as having a direct impact on their life in a way candidates don't. So they tend to take it out of the partisan lens when uh, making decisions on them. Thank yeah, I completely you. agree. Yeah, and here in Maine, we have sort of a rural area of the state that is um, generally seems to be in a po opposition to ballot questions, and the and the more um, urban areas, the more suburban areas seem to be where they arise they arise from. So there is an issue with you know different parts of the state feeling differently about initiatives. Thanks for those answers. Um, what resources would you suggest to get a better understanding about the history of an issue we would like to take place on the ballot? So which local or state 
offices or agencies could point us in the right direction to research on such an issue? Well, here in Maine, um, almost no, there's almost never a measure that hasn't at least been thought about by the legislature previously. So one of the first resources I would look to is past public hearings on related questions and find the testimony that was given at those public hearings pro and con and understand why the measure didn't go forward and who supported it and who opposed it and their reasons and whether you can make it better. That would be one of the first resources. And then we have, we have a research library at the law um, at the legislature that also has legislative histories and a lot of good background information. Yeah, I would say um, definitely checking out what's been put forward in the legislature. The, um, if you want to see if the issues actually made it to the ballot previously, you can the National Conference of State Legislators legislatures, NCSL, has a really great database of every single ballot measure that's ever been voted on in any state, and you can narrow it by state, by year, and by issue to really just see if something's come up before in any given state. So that can be another great way. But otherwise, I also second going to your um, state legislature's website to see what kind of discussions have happened about it previously. Great. All right. We do have a few more questions. So um, well, I have someone asking about the limits for 501c3 and political advocacy. And that's a whole webinar on its own. Um, we've hosted some in the past. You can find them on our YouTube page. We have a lot of resources on our website. We will host another webinar on 501c3 ad political advocacy um, this year. And we um, always recommend our friends over at Alliance for Justice and their Boulder Advocacy Campaign um, for more resources. And I'll in make sure to include a link to some of these things I just referenced in the follow-up email uh, that'll go out to everyone next week um, so that you can make sure you're um, not stepping over those boundaries for political advocacy. Um, I have a question. Can you target a primary election for a ballot initiative? And if so, what are the pros and cons for that? Well, that just briefly, that, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, oh, so it, state, state law, yeah. Yeah, um, that's what I was going to say. It depends on state. Yeah. <laughs> and again, um, the some states, is, is <laughs> you can assess the electorate by looking at past elections and seeing if the kind of people who turned out are the kind of people who would support your measure. Great. So a big depends there. Uh, uh, can ballot measures be written in plain or common language, or do they need to be translated into this more legislative language? And what resources are available to assist citizen groups in doing this sort of translation? So nationally, that um, is another it depends answer. Every state has their own rules about what ballot measure language has to look like. Sometimes you have the full language, which is much more legislative language, and then you have what actually shows up on people's ballot when they go to vote, and that can tend to be like a what can be shortened to the ballot title or, there's, or the ballot summary, and that is usually written in more common language. But it really depends state by state, but a lot of states offer assistance with drafting. Some states require you to take up their assistance with drafting, but you can always ask your Secretary of State's office for resources there when it comes to drafting language. Great, thank you. Um, and if you are a nonprofit um, doing ballot measure work, of course your role, you know, once that language is written, is to make sure the voters understand the ballot measure. Because I know every time there's a ballot measure, I do a lot of reading to make sure I understand w what my yes or no vote will mean. Because even if it seems like it's written in a really plain way, like, it can be confusing. And I always try to double and triple check to make sure I'm um, 
because even though I'll know what I want to have happen, I have to check, like, oh, does that mean vote yes or vote no on this one? Um, so last couple of questions. Um, we have one about groups that help educate and fund persons with disabilities to run a successful campaign. I'd say to um, talk to AAPD, um, the American Association for People with Disabilities, or um, National Disability Rights Network. Uh, but Kelly, do you know of any other groups that uh, deal specifically with disabilities and maybe have robust advocacy arms? Those were actually the two organizations I was going to name. I find myself going to AAPD quite often, actually, um, to get their expertise. So I was going to name those same places. Great. And uh, we have someone in Texas, and they're asking, what possible means can we use to push local issues there? Because it looks like Texas does not have ballot measures. Yes. In Texas, something that we have been seeing increasingly are um, municipal measures, so passing them in the cities or the counties to get issues pushed, and that can actually be a great way of changing the conversation if you get an issue passed in multiple municipalities. It can kind of ch make the legislature take, pay attention and ideally take action, potentially to put something on the ballot, but we've been seeing an increase in municipal level action in Texas. And it's a lot of the same... Same campaign phases, same things to take into account to get something on the ballot at, your minis at the city or county level. Great. Well, that takes care of all of our questions. Um, I want to thank you, Kelly and John, again for being um, such gracious and informative speakers and educating all of us on um, how to do effective ballot measure advocacy, especially getting those coalitions running um, and, and building our bases and getting that language right. Um, so to everyone um, in the audience, um, just a reminder that you will get an email next week with the slides, the recording, um, and uh, a few other resources. And uh, as we end the webinar, I just ask that you provide us a little feedback. This is the first time that Nonprofit Vote has run this webinar on this topic. So let us know, did we hit the mark? Was this the information you wanted? Is there more we could do to support you um, around ballot measure advocacy or any other sort of voter engagement topics? Um, so with that, I will say again, thank you, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their Pi Day. Thank you.